Good morning, it's Teresa. We're in the gardens for John chapter 15, where Jesus talks about being the true vine. The Jewish people thought that they had a right to get to heaven because they had a bloodline of Hebrew lineage. And Jesus was here to tell them, it's not your bloodline that gets you to heaven. It's by accepting that God made a way through me to pay for your sins so that you could be in the presence of God. And no one comes to the Father except through me, not even your bloodline. So they thought that they were true branches on the grapevine, which was the symbol for Israel. Grapes meant prosperity and abundance and a continuum of the bloodline. And so a lot of the times when you would see signs for Israel, it would be the grapevine. Sometimes it would be the pomegranate, and sometimes it would be the palm tree, but usually it was a grapevine. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. I take care of these gardens. God gives me the wisdom about how to do, what to do, when to do, and why to do. And Jesus is saying that God himself, the Father, is our gardener. And a lot of times I have to prune things back in my garden because leaves become dead or branches become dead. And I have to prune them back. If I don't, it will hinder the whole plant. So God says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. Here in the garden, I have sometimes fruit trees that have a branch that really doesn't seem to fit the tree. And the fruit that grows on it doesn't really make good fruit. And so that's a branch that I'll cut off. And that's how God is in our life. Through the Holy Spirit, he tells us what activities or what habits we have that are not good for us and that we need to let go of. So if we won't voluntarily let those things go in our life, they're going to produce trouble for us. And sometimes God will bring a situation around to where that thing has to be taken out of your life because it's so very important for you to complete the work that he has for you. Fruit trees don't strain bearing fruit. You don't see them going, mm, I need to make a peach. <laughs> they just do it. And that's how easy it should be for us to follow what God commands us to do. Jesus says that he cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. Grape vines will produce more than one branch. There will be a branch that produces fruit, and there will be a branch that doesn't produce fruit. And if you don't cut off that branch that doesn't produce fruit, the branch that does produce fruit won't produce very good fruit. It's the same way with tomato plants. When you have tomato plants, there'll be a vine that grows like this and like this, and then there'll be a shoot that comes up in the middle, and that's called a sucker. And the sucker doesn't ever produce any tomatoes. So you're supposed to snip that sucker out so that the two branches that produce tomatoes can produce good tomatoes. I'm going to turn the camera over here to this metal thing of a tree and branches. I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is the, the bottom trunk of the tree and then it goes up and produces branches. If one of these branches is cut off, it cannot produce on its own. In fact, I have a, a branch that something broke off of one of my plants, and the rest of the plant is green and healthy, but this little piece right here uh, turned brown and started to wither. And that's what happens when we cut ourselves off from Jesus. Uh, we start to wither and dry, our spirit starts to wither and dry. But when we stay connected to the, the vine or the trunk, we flourish. So Jesus says, you've already been pruned and purified by the message. 
he brought God's commands to us. This is a noisy day in the garden. We've got a helicopter going over. Next door, my neighbors are digging a trench and using a buzz saw to cut down a tree. I wonder where they're going. Jesus tells us he's already pruned and purified us through his message. He's let us know what needs to be cut out of our lives. And then he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Remember the little piece that I showed you just a minute ago? It won't continue to have life and it simply can't produce fruit. So when we stay remaining in God's word, learning God's word and obeying God's word, then fruit starts to be produced in our life. When we help somebody, when we obey, there's something that is produced and it's called goodness. And we can see it and other people can see it as well. A branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. That's called abiding in Jesus. How do you abide in Jesus? Well, prayer is one way. Reading the word is another. Sharing the gospel is another. Making sure you're obeying. That's another way of ab abiding. All through the Old Testament, the prophets used Israel comparing it to a vine. In Isaiah 5, he sings a song about the Lord's vineyard, how he planted Israel in the land. Now I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. That's talking about the nation of Israel. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press on nearby rocks. If you have wine, if you have grape vines, you've got to have a wine press so that you can press the grapes and make the wine. He waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. The people of Israel did not obey. And now God is going to judge them. He said, I expected sweet grapes. Why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. And God did. Then over in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who preached to the people of Israel uh, before they were taken captive by the Babylonians. He's speaking for God and said, But I was the one who planted you, choosing a vine of the purest stock, the very best. How did you grow into this corrupt wild vine? No amount of soap or lye can make you clean. I see the stain of your guilt. I, the sovereign Lord, has spoken. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel brings a message from the Lord to the people and says, This message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, how does a grapevine compare to a tree? A grape wood, grapevine wood, is as is it as useful as the wood of a tree? Can its wood be used for making things like pegs to hang up pots and pans? No, it can only be used for fuel. And even as fuel, it burns up too quickly. Vines are useless before and after being put in the fire. So the Lord says the people of Jerusalem are like grapevines growing among the trees of the forest. Since they are useless, I have thrown them on the fire to be burned. And I will see to it that if they escape from one fire, they will fall into another. And when I turn against them, you will know that I am the Lord and I will make the land desolate because my people have been unfaithful to me. They were worshiping other gods. Hosea says how prosperous Israel is, a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit. But the richer people get, the more pagan altars they build. The more bountiful their harvest, the more beautiful their sacred pillars to other gods. The hearts of the people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break down their altars and smash their sacred temples. And then they will say, we have no king because we didn't fear the Lord. 
that even if they did have a king, they would say, what would he do for us anyway? So all through scripture, the prophets compared Israel to being a grapevine. And God said they were useless to him. They were bitter grapes because they did not obey him. One way to abide in Jesus and stay connected to the true vine is to obey. Jesus says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I wonder where my little, here it is, my little broken off branch. Jesus says, apart from me, you can't produce anything. And you know, I believe that to be true because I wasn't very productive before I started doing what God told me to do. But once I started doing what God told me to do, I got fruit all over the place. I got fruit to share with other people. He says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now, why would that be so? Can you really reward an obedient child? No. And if you do, you're just teaching them to be disobedient is okay. God does reward, reward those that are obedient to his word. When you do what he says to do in the word, and you're not alone. You've got the Holy Spirit inside of you to help you, to give you strength, to give you guidance and what is the right way? And so if you remain in Jesus and in the words that he preaches, you can ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Makes Jesus smile when we obey him. That's what I tell my grandkids when they're disobeying. You're not going to make Jesus smile if you do that. But if you do this, you'll make him smile. Don't you want to make him smile? Don't you want to make him smile? I do. He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and I remain in his love. Isn't that beautiful? I have told you these things so that you will be filled with all joy. It makes me very joyful to obey and then get rewarded. Why wouldn't it? It's a joyful thing. Your joy will overflow. And this is my other commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. For there is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. Jesus called us his friends. The only friends Jesus had were sinners. And he called them to step out of their sin and obey God the Father so they could produce fruit. Think about that. The only friends that he had was sinners. It wasn't all the hoity-toities that acted like they were doing good. No, those were the religious leaders that were doing bad and they were the ones that got thrown in the fire. They weren't abiding in the Father. They didn't even recognize who the Father was. They were so wrapped up in their own ways. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. He's calling us his friends. There's a song that we used to sing when I was growing up. It went, um, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The man that wrote that song was engaged, and the night before he was to be married, his wife drowned, a wife to be. And he moved to Canada from Ireland, and he met another woman and fell in love. And two weeks 
before they got married, she died also. And right after that, he got word that his mother in Ireland was dying, but he didn't have the money to go home to be with her. So he wrote that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, in a letter to her to tell her he was still comforted because Jesus was comforting him because Jesus was his friend. Jesus called Abraham his friend, and he called Moses his friend. They were the only ones in the Old Testament that God called friends, but he called many friends in the New Testament. John was one of his closest friends. Paul was his friend. Peter was his friend. We are his friends. Jesus says, you are my friends when you obey what I say. But a friend works against you, right? So if you're working against Jesus, against what he says, you can't really be called his friend, can you? He says, there's no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. Jesus laid his life down so that we could come and live with the Father forever, so that our sins could be paid for. He had a very special purpose. It was God himself coming into the physical form, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that was pay for any sin that we had committed. We only had one life to give up. Jesus gave his life up so that many could be saved. And he says, we need to love each other that same way. We need to lay our lives down for each other. In 2 Corinthians, I believe that's in 2 Corinthians, Paul says that a husband should lay his life down for his wife like Jesus laid his life down for the church. And that's a very important thing. That means if he's watching the Super Bowl and she's having an emotional meltdown, the Super Bowl game gets turned off and he supports his wife. He thinks about her feelings really before he thinks about his own. And he takes it before his father what he should do to make sure he gets good counsel because Jesus is his head just as the wife is under the husband and the husband is her head. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. He doesn't tell his slaves what's going on. He just tells them what to do. But he said, now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father has told me. He didn't hold anything back. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. There's another place in scripture that it says no one comes to the Father unless he is called. If you're listening to this video, you are called. You are being courted by the Lord because he loves you and he wants you to be his friend. He wants to tell you all these things like he told his disciples. Remember, they had just left the upper room and he's giving them this teaching as they are walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know if they stopped and sat down along the way or not. I just know that they were on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane when he was giving them this teaching. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you, get that, appointed you. You are an ambassador or a representative of Jesus. Just like a king when he would knight someone and then send them out to do battle. If that knight just stayed in the castle, eating and drinking and having fellowship, no battles would be won. He appoints you and then he sends you out as an ambassador. And an ambassador represents the one that sends them. Just like Jesus was an ambassador of God the Father. And now he sends us out. In chapter 14, Jesus said, you're going to do greater works than I do. And a lot of people go, what does that mean? And I did too. And I asked the Holy Spirit and he said, Jesus was only on the earth for three years. And he only preached in Palestine. But the ones that he preached to went out to the whole world. And as long as I have been doing these teachings, which has been about eight years and been two and a half years on the video, I've been spreading the word too. And there's a lot of people that I don't even know that hear this word. Are they friends of mine? I don't even know who they are. But we're connected through the vine, through Jesus. 
because he is the two, true vine and we are the branches. We are his ambassadors. He says, I have told you everything the father told me. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. That lasting fruit is when you share the word of God and someone receives it, then they're going to be in the kingdom forever as well. And that's pretty lasting, lasting fruit. You're sharing your fruit with them. They're sharing their fruit with others. It's an everlasting sharing. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. When you use the name of Jesus, Jesus is carrying your request to the Father. And there's several different things. You have to pray in faith. You have to make sure that what you're praying for is according to the Father's will, something that you know he would want for you in your life. Uh, not winning the lottery, but maybe having a relationship that was broken be mended again. Maybe uh, giving you the ability to have the words to speak to someone that's struggling so that you can encourage them. Uh, when you're praying and you're asking God for something that's according to His will, that's going to not just benefit you. We don't just pray for self-gratification. We pray for things that will benefit ourselves and others. And that's an important thing to pray. And when you pray that in Jesus' name, He's whispering in the Father's ear. The friends of the kings back in days of royalty had the ear of the king. They could come and go as they wanted. Other people had to be called by the king to come. But once you are a friend of Jesus through your salvation, you can approach him at any time of the day and night. And his re your request, he then takes before the Father. And because Jesus is the one doing the asking, the Father says, yes. He says, this is my command, love each other. The only answer is always love. But then Jesus tells the disciples a hard thing because he wants to prepare them for what's gonna happen to them. Up until now, anytime the Pharisees tried to um, attack the disciples because they didn't wash their hands before they ate and did all the ritual cleansings and everything, Jesus would step up and say, um, they don't have to do that because they've washed their body and uh, we don't observe rules and regulations like y'all do to make us feel worthy. We believe that God is the one that makes us feel worthy. And Jesus says that what he did for you on the cross should make you feel tremendous worth. But he wants the disciples to be prepared for the persecution that's gonna come. So he says, if the world hates you, and there's a lot of people that hate Christians now. If the world hates you, remember it hated me first. Also, I want to remind you that John wrote this gospel about 30 years after Jesus had already been uh, crucified and resurrected. And Jesus is trying to prepare them for this time. If the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so the world hates you for it. People who are still doing things that are bad, they don't like the people that are doing good any longer because it makes them feel bad and they actually can hate you. I, I lost four friends one year, the year that I stopped drinking. And uh, I heard one of them say to her husband, I'm just not getting anything out of this relationship anymore. He said, so leave it. And she did. And God brought me 10 godly friends that um, weren't going to turn their back on me if I didn't do everything they wanted me to do. He says, do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master since they persecuted me. Naturally, they will persecute you. And this word slave in the Greek there means someone that is used in the hands of a master. And masters in those days would just tell their slaves what to do. 
But remember, Jesus said, you're no longer a slave to me. You are my friend if you obey my commands. He says, a slave is not greater than its master. We do serve the Lord, but we are used by him in wonderful ways. And he lets us know why he's using us and the way he's using us most of the time. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. So the ones that have a calling are going to listen to you when you share the gospel with them. When you share, it's your testimony that you share. People are going to listen to the experiences of how reading the word or accepting Jesus Christ has helped you in your life. Later on, they'll start receiving the gospel. But to begin with, usually they receive your testimony. They will do all of this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. He's talking about the Pharisees and the leaders rejecting him. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have no excuse for their sin. It's sinning when you don't accept the word of God. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be so guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. They hated Jesus because Jesus told them they were doing it wrong. And they were teaching other people to do it wrong too. And they were doubly responsible because they were the leaders. And God holds leaders doubly responsible. That's why anytime I realize that I said something on a video that wasn't right, I try to correct it. I make mistakes. I'm human. He said, it fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without a cause. Psalms 80 says that, that they hated the Messiah without reason. All he was doing was bringing them the truth. He wasn't doing anything against them, so it was without a cause. And then he assures them, the very last thing he says in chapter 15, but I will send the advocate, the Holy Spirit of truth to you. He will come to you by, from the Father. Remember Jesus said, I have to die and go to the Father so that the Father will send his Holy Spirit back to live in you like it lived in me. He said, uh, he will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. The Holy Spirit's job is to lead us into the truth of what Jesus means to us. He is our doorway. He is our channel to the Father. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. He's talking to his disciples. Now, we weren't there during Jesus' ministry, but it's all written down here, right here. We can read it. We can let the Holy Spirit minister to us what it means. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you about any decision that you're trying to make right now minister to you about any thing you're doing in your life whether it's pleasing to the father or not minister to you about how you can be more fruitful by sharing what god has done for you in your life i love you all and i so look forward to being with you next week for chapter 16 in the garden of gethsemane y'all take care